and welcome to another episode of Disney Movie Investigation. If this is your first time watching, welcome to the show. In each episode, we take a look at a movie that is featured on Disney+. Plus. On this episode, we're taking a look at a direct-to-video sequel as we take a look at Aladdin and the Return of Jafar. And stay tuned for our bonus story as we take a look at the history of Aladdin's Oasis. And if you are enjoying these videos, I do ask that you please hit that subscribe button. That way you'll be notified with each new episode. Now, sit back and enjoy this episode of Disney Movie Investigation. So like I said, today we are looking at Aladdin and the Return of Jafar. Uh, this was a direct-to-video sequel and it was released on May 20th, 1994. It was directed by Toby Shelton, Tad Stones, and Alan Zasloff. Uh, it was written by Kevin Campbell, M. Are, are Mirth J.S. Callow, Bill Motz, Steve Roberts, Dev Roths, Bob Roth, J. Jan Stardine, and Brian Swillen. So a lot of writers there. Uh, the production companies was Walt Disney Television Animation and Walt Disney Home Video, and it was distributed by, by Buena Vista Home Video. Uh, the budget for this movie was $5 million. So let's take a look at the production history. Uh, so after the success of The Little Mermaid, the animated series, uh, Disney did continued to develop other animated TV series to create the Disney afternoon. Uh, before the theatrical release of Aladdin, Di Disney commissioned Tad Stones and Alan Zasloff to develop a direct-to-television project that would help transition a film into a TV series. Um, initially, they were thinking of sequels, and Stones thought that the movie should be centered around Iago, and developed a story of how Iago would end up with Aladdin, which we kind of see that in the movie. Um, the initial plan was to premiere the Aladdin TV series with an hour-long premiere TV episode, but, St but Stones would suggest that uh, instead to do a direct-to-video DVD sequel, or direct-to-video sequel. Um, initially, this was met with resistance from Disney CEO Michael Eisner, and animation president Peter Schneider as they thought this would cheapen the brand of Aladdin. Um, layout designer Paul Felix though would be the one to convince Eisner that the quality would not be lowered when he showed them test footage of the opening sequence of the film. Uh, and this is the scene where Aladdin is entering the cave, the thieves are entering the caves. Um, the first half of the movie would be animated in Australia while the second half of the movie would be enter would be animated in Japan. The role of the genie would also be recast as they, as Robin Williams had a previous falling out with Disney management over his use of his voice in marketing in the original Aladdin. Um, Tad Stones would claim that Robin Williams was involved in the recasting decision and he was the one that selected Dan Castellaneta to reprise his role. Um, so let's take a look at the cast that we do get. Uh, so we had Scott Wa Wagner who returns to voice Aladdin. Brad Kane provides Aladdin's singing voice. Dan Castellaneta does the voice of the genie. Uh, Gilbert Godfrey returns as Iago. Uh, Linda Larkin as Jasmine. Uh, Jason Alexander provides the voice of Abysmal. And Jonathan Friedman as Jafar. In terms of the plot, Aladdin is adjusting to his new life as the upper and the upper crust, and he and Princess Jasmine may not be married yet, but the pressure of Disney of Palace Society has already begun. On top of that, Iago returns asking for help from Aladdin, and no one is happy to see him. Uh, but things begin to look up when the genie returns from his trip around the world. However, things take a quick turn when Jafar returns from his lamp and is discovered by a low-level crook named Abysmal. By using Abysmal, Jafar makes his way back into Agrabah with ideas of payback for Aladdin and his friends. Um, so in terms of recommending this movie, um, I find this mo movie quite disappointing um, as Aladdin is one of my favorite um, movies that I remember growing up. Um, and I think the story definitely had potential as you had that kind of like Jafar returning to get his revenge. Unfortunately, the characters often feel flat uh, with nothing to do and... Um, the animation quality here is really poor. Um, it's full of mistakes, especially when it comes to Jasmine. There's often times when uh, her she's off model, uh, and she her it's just off putting in general. Like I was watching it with a, f a group of friends, 
and they were even pointing it out and they're not even huge animation people um the songs are not memorable um and i f they feel very saturday morning cartoony not compared to the original aladdin songs uh, where they would advance the story in the film um overall this is one i would skip um i think it tarnishes the legacy of aladdin and it's it, it feels direct to video sequel and it's just one of those reasons why I'm not a big fan of these ones. Um, I think the story potentials are there, but unfortunately there's not, not enough quality put into them. Uh, so let's move on to our bonus story as we discuss Aladdin's Oasis. Uh, this was a restaurant and an entertainment area located in Disneyland. Um, the restaurant would open in 1993, replacing the Tahitian Terrace and would serve Middle Eastern food. The restaurant would also feature a dinner show following the storyline of Aladdin and Unfortunately, the dinner show would only last a few years and would be switched to seasonal status soon thereafter. Um, the Oasis was still there, however, and it would be used for character greetings, um, especially during Halloween parties and Christmas parties. Um, the venue would see some life again going back to serving food, but was limited to, to a nighttime show uh, with dining, pa dining packages um, or they could be used as uh, food to go. A lot of this was used as phantasmic dinner packages, uh, so uh, you could have the dinner at, uh, at the Oasis and then you could go and get a special seating at Phantasmic. Um, in 1997, the venue went back to character meet and greets, um, so it would be used for Christmas parties and Halloween parties again. Uh, in 2008, the venue saw again new life as it was used for an Indiana Jones and the Secret of the Stone Tiger dinner show. Um, they used the same set as the Aladdin show, so it was kind of a cost-effective move. And this was around the same time when they were promoting uh, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Um, <clears throat> the storytelling for Aladdin's Oasis would uh, operate seasonal, with their last performance being in 2017. On February 23rd, 2018, it was announced that Aladdin's Oasis would be replaced by a new restaurant called the Tropical Hideaway. So I've never actually been in there. Uh, I've actually, sorry, I've been in there for uh, character greetings and stuff like that, but I've never actually eaten in there. Um, from the pictures I've seen, it is, seems like a cool place. And it was a, kind of a nice tie-in to Aladdin uh, during the height of its popularity in the early 90s. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us here on another episode of Disney Movie Investigation. I would invite anyone to please leave a comment below on what they think of Aladdin and the return of Jafar, as well as if you were able to have uh, the dinner show at Aladdin Oasis. I would love to know of your experience. So as we look forward to our next episode, we are going to take it a look at an international comedy as we take a look at Bootman. And for our bonus story of that episode, we are going to be looking at the history of Disney's international programs. So until next time, I hope you have a magical day and we will see you real soon.